So we will go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation. My name is Stephanie Wolf and I am the Membership Relations Coordinator here at Population Connection. I'm so excited about this talk and to hear from one of our global partners. On the call today, we will be hearing from Dr. Marnie LaFleur, founder and director of Lemur Love. After witnessing deforestation and poaching of wild ring-tailed lemurs, Dr. Marnie founded Lemur Love to protect lemurs in southwestern Madagascar. In addition to her work with Lemur Love, she's also an associate professor at the University of San Diego, where she teaches biological anthropology. And we also have Dr. Sejano Cordon Adrian Saralaza, who serves as the in-country director of Lemur Love. She oversees all Lemur Love staff and programs within Madagascar. And a big congrats to Dr. Sejano for recently being named one of the Explorers Club's 50 people changing the world. Thank you to Dr. Marnie and Dr. Sejano for being here today and sharing your work with us. Uh, if you have any questions for our speakers, please drop them in the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen and we will do our very best to get them answered the, during the Q&A session, which will be moderated by our senior analyst, Hannah Evans. Hannah is currently teaching a class, so she may have to hop off a few minutes early, but if there are a lot of questions, we will uh, finish off the hour. Uh, and for any questions we don't have time to answer, we will provide written answers along with the recording of this presentation, the presentation slides, and access to the chat box discussion. Since you guys always drop some great links and information in there, those will be accessible. All right, uh, that's all the housekeeping items for me. Uh, let's go ahead and jump in. We'll get the presentation started and I will send it over to you, Dr. Marnie. Great, thank you so much. And thank you for having us. Um, oh, look at this. My, I'm sorry, my chat box is open. I'm seeing my stepdaughter, Dr. Andrea Baden. She's a collaborator of mine and we, ha we were, are working on a project um, together on um, uh, genetics of, of wild ring-tailed lemurs. So that's interesting. It's a small world. You just never know who you're gonna run into. Um, so mostly I'm going to tell stories today um, and talk about our work in Madagascar, but starting out, I will just tell you that I am an animal person. I'm just one of those people that is really drawn to animals. My whole life I've been um, just keen on animals, and I knew that in some way in my professional career I would work with animals. So I am a professor, um, and I study lemurs, and a little over a decade ago I started Lemur Love. I also really like food um, and being in Southern California, I particularly like tacos and, and I'm getting to be um, a good taco aficionado, I think. Um, and yes, I told you this, that I just am generally enthusiastic about animals. This is my dog, Banana, here and my cat, um, Stinkerbell. This obviously was a long time ago. We don't have that kitty anymore. So um, just a little bit about lemurs for those that may not be very familiar. They are the primates that are found on the island of Madagascar. So if they're a primate, they're not a human and they're on Madagascar, it's a lemur. And lemurs are not found anywhere else. So if there's primates outside of Madagascar, um, other than in captivity, they are not lemurs. So I first went to Madagascar in 2005. I had the opportunity to go um, because my undergraduate professor had um, funding to take students to the field. And my first tri trip was actually a, a disaster. Um, the field site that I went to, the animals were being hunted. And so I couldn't really do the research I wanted to, and it was just not really that fun. Um, so I thought, well, that's neat. I got to go to Madagascar once, um, and I probably won't ever go again. And lo and behold, almost um, nearly 20 years later, and I've been going um, almost annually ever since. And um, the reason was I got the opportunity to go again, and I became just really fascinated with female dominance in lemurs. So as someone who just loves animals, been observing animals my whole life, um, following lemurs around and seeing that the females were in charge, females leading the groups. It was just, I, I couldn't understand how this could happen and why, why this happened and why the males put up with it. Why do they, why do they let these, these ladies boss them around? And so from an energetic perspective, if we talk about mammals, this doesn't apply to humans because humans have really complicated um, culture and we have technology and we control our reproduction. So uh, humans are really different. But in terms of non-human animals and mammals in particular, um, it's expensive for females to 
produce offspring. So they have to, females have to gestate, they have to lactate, and they have to carry that baby. And lactation is really extraordinarily expensive. And so from a, the perspective of a wild primate or wild, any type of wild mammal, um, females are most concerned with getting enough food and food is what limits their reproduction. So females tend to compete, as we say, over food resources. And it's not that males don't also need food, of course they do, but in terms of reproduction, food isn't what limits male reproduction because um, they don't have the same energetic demands. So their reproduction is limited over access to females. So females compete over food and males compete over females. And this leads to um, female choice of mates and male-male competition for females. So we see things um, in these mammals, like in these males, like increased body size, weaponry. Weaponry can be things like these great big canine teeth. Those aren't for eating. Um, th those aren't because this, this baboon is a carnivore. Those are selected for um, be a female choosing her mate with, that has those traits. So these males tend to have these showy traits. They tend to be bigger. They tend to be slightly more aggressive. And as a byproduct of that, um, males are almost always, almost always socially dominant over females. So if we have some, if we have an example um, of an approach retreat, what that means is if two animals are coming up to one another and they stop, somebody is going to back off usually, unless there's going to be a fight or something. But if, if a male and a female gorilla come up to one another, the female will always back off. If there's food or if there's, there's some reason, it will be the female because the male is socially dominant. If we look at lemurs, this isn't the case. And the, the other thing about lemurs is that females and males are the same size. So in baboons and gorillas and in, in most species, the males are quite a bit bigger. So they are dominant both physically and socially. Lemurs, they are able, females are able to dominate just based on their social skills. So it's really very interesting. Um, and there are 113 extant species of lemur. So this is a very biodiverse group. Um, there are also 17 species that have gone recently extinct. This is between about 500 years ago and 2,500 years ago, roughly that those species went extinct. Um, as I said, males and females are monomorphic. That means that they're the same size. And females are able to maintain dominance socially rather than physically. And so this has really driven most of my research. Um, as I said, just following lemurs around in the forest and seeing how different they are compared to other species of mammal. I just found this really very fascinating. And um, this is what I study. The, the um, potentially ironic thing is there could be no reason. It could just be like a random sweepstakes effect that took place. So I could actually study this phenomenon my whole life um, for no reason, but uh, it's interesting enough that I'm willing to, I'm willing, willing to gamble on that one. Okay, um, so I'm just, I'm gonna tell you a few stories from, from the field in my um, almost two decades of doing field work in Madagascar. I really, really love being with the animals. So this picture I took, um, we call this the lemur ball, where they're all in one little ball together because they like to keep warm. Um, and this is a group of females. So it's all the ladies are together. And this, um, the one with the eyes looking right at the camera here, this was a male. And he was trying to sneak into this female lemur ball, which is like a big no-no. And he knows that, trying to sneak in there. Um, so he actually cuddled into that lemur ball and was there for a, like a a half of a second before the females realized and they chased him right out because boys are not allowed in the in the in the lady ball. Um, so I really do enjoy being with these animals and being out in the forest. This is the same uh, uh, an animal from the same troop of lemurs. So I followed these three troops since 2008. So I know individuals and I can um, I can recognize the um, individuals from these groups, and just to be able to follow them, to see their lives, to see the challenges they face, to see who they're friends with, maybe who they're not friends with, um, how they decide to spend their days. It's just really, it's wonderful to be able to do this, just out in the forest 
where time doesn't really matter, where there's no appointments, and there's nothing else to do other than just to follow lemurs and see what see what we're going to get up to today. Um, it's really is a wonderful experience. And I'm generally curious, naturally curious, interested in looking at things and getting dirty and figuring things out. Um, so just being around in the forest, you never know what you're going to find, especially um, I love to to um, download and view the camera trap photos to see what the animals are doing when I'm not there. We can find things. Um, these were uh, hunting spears, so I, not, I don't want to find that in the forest, but um, you know, we can, I'm always interested to see what has been going on, what is going on. Um, this here is predator scat, so I can also um, determine who, which predator species are around and who they're consuming. Um, and here we were collecting some lemur urine. One of the things I'm interested in is metabolism and how metabolism compares between males and females. The hypothesis is that lemur females, because of the unusual and harsh conditions in Madagascar, that if they weren't dominant over males, they wouldn't be able to successfully reproduce. Um, so this has been selected for and able to ensure that females can have, have their babies and survive. Um, so the, what, what I'm looking at there is the comparison of uh, metabolic rates between males and females. Um, I'll tell you though that, uh, as I said, I've been doing this for almost 20 years. I really dislike traveling. Um, which is unfortunate because it takes a lot of travel. Um, it takes me about 10 days to get from my house to the field site. It's about 40 hours from California to landing in Madagascar. Um, and it's just not, not really that fun. I, it, you might be able to see right over here. This is a mess of my office um, prior to leaving. And here's my, my cat, Stinker Bell, just thinking like, what the heck? Um, so it takes flights. Um, cars, a zebu car in the ocean, um, all types of travel, which um, none of which I particularly enjoy. And I'm always I'm always motion sick, so I just if any if, if you understand what that feels like, it's not it's just not really very fun. Um, and some I've had some um, adventures along the way. This was way back in 2011. Um, and this was when Cyclone Bingzia, Bingzia um, hit Madagascar, and I very unfortunately got stuck in um, in a uh, a large open area, um, trying to get back to the field. And it took this this drive should take about ten hours. It actually took about five days to get there. Um, and this was after having dengue fever, so I was not in the healthiest place. And um, trying to get through that was really challenging. We get out of the car and every day try to push it out of that mud. We we actually just drove straight into a a lake that we couldn't see because it was like raining sideways, and we just got stuck in that lake. And this photo, a lot of the water has drained, but for the first couple of nights we were in about three feet of water. And this here is a, a golden rain toad. These go dormant during times of drought, but they emerge when it rains. So these frogs literally came out of the earth in what I would call biblical proportions. And they're very they're known for being very loud. So they they come out of the earth, they scream, and they release their gametes. So by the time it was morning, there was um, about this much frog spawn on top of the lake that we were living in. Um, so these are the kinds of things that happen when you're traveling around and trying to get to really remote places um, in Madagascar. And uh, I, I'll give you a content warning a little too late there, but other things about the field, there's just always something wrong with me um, in the field. I'm normally pretty robust. I'm, I'm pretty healthy, but I get all kinds of skin problems. This is one of the last times I was in the field. Um, my toenails peeled off, which I know is like pretty gross. Um, and it didn't hurt. It was no problem. I don't know why. Um, this is just something that tends to happen. They're normal now. They came back. It's fine. Um, but these things just happen in the field. Uh, if anybody is a little bit hesitant about spiders, not particularly, but, you know, I work towards my, my relationship with them. Um, sometimes when you go to the field, it's 
sometimes there's a lot of caterpillars or there's a lot of flowers or it's really dry or there's a lot of spiders. Um, 2015 was definitely year of the spider and these are big they can be you know this size and they are in the forest right at your face so you come through a bunch of scrub and trying to get through and follow the lemurs and they're right there in your face and I'll, I'll say that um, spider eyes are reflective so when you wear a, a headlamp at night to be able to see you can you can catch their eyes they, they, their eye shine reflects so you can see it and this year 2015 when it was year of the spider um at night the forest looked like i'll say like a magic carpet like the, it was just constantly moving and it was all the glitter of all of these spider eyes so um try going to sleep in your tent <laughs> when um you're a little bit afraid and you know that the entire world is moving with spiders um not not the greatest part of the field but it's always an adventure so I'll mention some of the um, problems in Madagascar and problems um, related to conservation. So um, Madagascar is one of the 10 poorest countries in the world in terms of economics. So um, there are many people in Madagascar that are that are classified as being in extreme poverty. And it's not uncommon for there to be famine, particularly in the south. So this is something that has plagued Madagascar um, for the last couple of hundred years. And conservation and extreme poverty in this way are not compatible. So we can't have robust, sustainable conservation and have people living in extreme poverty. It, do, it just doesn't work. Um, we can't have it. And so this is a picture of a village nearest to the field site where, um, where we work. And so it's, it's um, pretty simple and there's not much there. So no electricity, no running water, um, no access to sanitation, very limited access to health care. And so these are the challenges when trying to maintain a conservation um, program. And Madagascar was a French colony. So up until, uh, Sahin, was it 60, 1969, when Madagascar became independent? Was it 69? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. So it was a French colony. Um, and we know that anytime an, a country is colonized, there's patterns that tend to, uh, patterns of things that tend to happen. Um, and we see these in Madagascar. So part of the legacy of colonial, colonialism is that there tends to be civil unrest or tensions between um, government and people. Um, Colonists tend to leave Christianity, which has impacts on um, reproduction and reproductive rights. Poverty and inf insufficient infrastructure, um, exploited natural resources, and deep societal divisions. So these are things that tend to happen, and they this legacy has been left also in Madagascar. Um, and one of these that is, I think, is particularly important in um, conservation that is sustainable is noting that children in Madagascar are rarely taught about their own biodiversity. So the system that the French left in place, the education system, was based on European flora and fauna. And so this is what children learn about in school, rather than learning about the biodiversity of Madagascar. So instead of growing up, learning to love what is around them and learning to really appreciate the immense biodiversity that they have right in their own backyard. They learn about things like bears and wolverines and um, animals that don't live in Madagascar at all. And so continuing from that, funding for school in, in Madagascar, it's quite underfunded. So post-secondary um, education is tends to be underfunded and underdeveloped. And then when we get to the graduate level, there's been, um, there's a law in place that means that um, foreigners that come to do research have to train um, students, Malagasy students, which in theory is really great. Um, we need to contribute to the knowledge base in Madagascar. But um, in the past, it has been mostly that these students are trained to be good assistants rather than to be good researchers themselves. And so this is something that I think is changing now, but it still is. Um, this is part of this legacy that is left behind um, and some of the problems that we're trying to address. So we work to protect lemurs, 
empower women and further science. And we are working towards several of the sustainable development goals. Um, no poverty being probably the most important um, in terms of addressing conservation needs in Madagascar. Um, and so we prioritize working with wild lemurs rather than um, those that are in captivity or those ha that have been rescued. It's not that these aren't important as well. It's just that we prioritize those wild locations because as long as there is habitat and there are animals there, um, we can we we still have them. We can work to ensuring that those still that those may stay. Um, and then people living next to those wild lemurs, because those are the those individuals are people who are most likely to um, need natural resources to survive. So we work with the wild animals, people next to those wild lemurs, and then also the next generation of Malagasy conservationists and researchers. These people are, are local or Malagasy young people are really the best suited to be able to enact sustainable conservation, um, but in the past they have been all but excluded from um, conservation and research. Um, so wild lemurs, I've told you a bit about what we do already. We have um, a ranger camp that is located within Samanapetsus National Park, um, and these rangers track three, the three groups of lemurs that I mentioned before that I've followed um, since 2008, so they monitor those animals for us and collect samples for us as well. Um, with local people, we work through women. So particularly through COVID, we had a number of um, programs that were just to get money flowing um, in, in our communities because when, when things stopped and there wasn't any um, food moving around or vehicles moving around, it just became very critical that um, people be able to get um, be able to get food and medicine and the way that that had to happen was by way of money so um, that was one way we also support a school that prioritizes environmental education and prioritizes girls being in school so in in lots of regions areas with really high poverty rates um, often boys are prioritized so boys go to school and girls often won't but um, this school prioritizes girls and this leads to long-term good because if girls are learning and in school um, they will delay having children for um, longer and then they'll have more options once they get to be adults and then that next generation so we support the academic work and research of um, graduate students in Madagascar Malagasy graduate students and are really working to get them to be good researchers as opposed to get them to be able to help other people do their research. So from um, funding and coming up with the idea for research all the way through the publication process and getting work disseminated, um, it, all of these are important to, for um, building a career. And that's, that's it. I'm going to end there and I'm going to um, turn it over to Sahinu. So I will stop my share. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mami. Yeah, um, I don't have a um, PowerPoint uh, presentation, but uh, what I just want to mention is that um, one of the most uh, important part of our work at Limulov is that we integrate all of the aspects to 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 make a difference and to 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 contribute to have a change in terms of conservation which is the richness of which is the yeah the richness of madagascar we don't have other things we have the biodiversity and the lemurs are only found in madagascar and that's the, the one part and the second part is that we also want to have the next generation of conservationists, of Malagasy conservationists to be involved, to be engaged, because at the end of the day, we as Malagasy, we have to do the work and we have to ensure that our children will see again wild lemurs and have the biodiversity. And, and be, but it's important for us to get education, to, 
to have the to 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 can to feed our families every day. So with the extreme poverty is also another problem. So we want at Limerov, we want to integrate all of these aspects, and it's not it's challenging. It's challenging, but we can we think that we can contribute at our level, a small scale, a local scale, but we will do we will we will try our best to make a difference. Yes, thank you. Okay, is that is that it for the presentation? Yes, thank I you so, so much. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, fantastic. That was really wonderful. It's uh, it's it's so great to get to hear from our global partners and to learn more about the work that you all are doing in some really at-risk regions around the world. Uh, thank you so much for logging on today and, and being here with us. Um, I have a few questions that were pre-submitted that I'll go through and then hopefully we can just uh, facilitate a discussion between the three of us. And then of course, if everybody or if anyone has any questions that they'd like answered um, live here, please feel free to voice them in the chat. We've got Stephanie and Marion here who are helping to facilitate all of that as well. Um, okay, so we've got a couple of questions here asking about the state of lemurs right now um, in terms of their populations and their remaining populations. Um, they're wondering if the remaining populations of lemurs are stable or if the loss of their habitat due to continued deforestation or habitat destruction or agricultural expansion has like really devastated their remaining habitats. What's the, the situation right now? Um, I would say not stable. <laughs> Unfortunately, lemurs are the most endangered group of mammals on the planet, um, meaning that the, the, they have the highest number of species that are either um, endangered or critically endangered. And um, that has really been exacerbated by COVID. So the, and the reason why is because poverty has gotten worse. And so um, people that don't have access, people that are in extreme poverty don't have a lot of choice as to how they um, how they feed themselves day to day. And so this is often um, ends up being natural resource extraction. Um, so that continues to shrink the habitat of the of the lemurs. Yeah, and in terms of the, the poverty and natural habitat destruction uh, and the influence that that has on lemurs, could you expand upon that a little bit more? Like you said, yeah. natural extraction, um, but what, what exactly does that mean? And then I was also curious about your poverty alleviation programs, um, what, what exactly they entail. Yeah, so um, in terms of resource extraction, if you think of if you are a person that lives in a rural area, and I showed that picture of a village where you, there's really not very much there, but you are next to say a um, national park or even just a forested area, there will be things that you can extract from the forest in order to just to, to eat yourself or to be able to um, say make something, maybe traditional medicine or um, be able to make various things from resources in the forest and sell those in order to get food for yourself and your family. So it's just when there isn't any other option, um, that's what people will do. And so it's, it's important to um, like, it's not that people want to, it's not like people, you know, Malagasy people know that we don't need to tell them, nobody needs to tell Malagasy people that there's a conservation um, crisis, they know, but when you don't have the choice, this is what you have to do. And so um, having an, an option to do something else is what really the goal is. So um, it doesn't have to be a huge amount different um, in order to make it so that somebody will prefer to do the thing that doesn't um, exploit the environment. So for example, if you have to collect firewood every day, you have to go to the forest in order to get to get wood to have a fire to cook your food because there's no electricity. Um, if, if there's some program, local program, where you can access cooking fuel as opposed to going all the way to the forest to find these resources to bring back to use, it'll be much easier and it's a really simple solution. Um, but that has to be, there has to be some development in place in order for that, um, that alternative to be present. Mm -hmm. and, and is the government helping NGOs? No, or no? no, no. Do they act more as a barrier than yes. anything else? Absolutely. Okay. 
Yeah. yeah. And has that always been the case or is there a potential <laughs> in the future for like collaboration? Because I assume it's it's pretty important, right, to have government buy-in, not only in terms of conservation, but also in terms of like um, access to family planning, uh, better reproductive health, better health, health outcomes in general. I, I don't have a very um, optimistic outlook. There's really, really high corruption, which makes it really very difficult, um, particularly as a foreigner, as an outsider. It's really difficult for me to understand and navigate. What do you think, Sahin? Do you, do you have hope that the government will um, do anything good? <laughs> Not much of um for the government uh yeah for, uh, there is a high corruption and and it's really unfortunate because um we we have this tendency to be generalists and say all of the authorities are highly corrupted which is not true because there are some fabulous persons at the, the ministry or over at the university but when you look and take take step back and see at the national level, it's very sad. So that's the that's a problem. So do you have hope uh, in the south of Madagascar? Do you have hope for Madagascar in global? It's really difficult to respond to that. <laughs> We've um, chosen an approach of because conservation can be very quickly overwhelming. Um, and these, these are huge problems. I mean, extreme poverty of millions of people, um, the loss of biodiversity, these are really huge and almost hard to comprehend sometimes. And um, we can get discouraged really easily when we think about how massive these problems are. But we've taken the approach of focusing on a select few areas that we think are key, and we put our efforts there. So the, the lemur groups that we follow, one of the goals of my life is for these lemurs to outlive me. And so what that means is that those groups have to be there and their descendants, of course, not the actual lemur, not the actual individuals. The lemurs have to be there. The forest has to be in place. In order for the forest to have to be in place, the people that live next to that forest can't be, can't subsist on in extreme poverty. Um, and we need the new generation of Malagasy researchers to also pick up this trade. Um, so this is the approach that we've taken, um, which it seems like it would make more sense to go, um, you know, from a policy level down. That unfortunately just doesn't doesn't work. The government is is ineffective and and too corrupt um, to collaborate with. We've found that we've sort of navigated our own way to ensuring that that we can protect an, an area. Yeah, well, I mean, it's it's just so good that you guys are there and, and inciting grassroots bottom up change, which probably is something that our entire world would benefit from anyway, um, but especially in a place like Madagascar. Thank you for clarifying uh, that that complicates things, but it's also interesting and, and important to note. Um, in terms of the, uh, I, I guess there's a question here just asking kind of generally about the the kind of situation in Madagascar and if the the film Madagascar helped kind of shed light on Madagascar as a country what it's going through in terms of conservation and maybe any efforts um, or interest in, in in helping I think so I mean I noticed that that was released in 2005 which uh, was the first year that I went to Madagascar and um, in the years following that people knew what Madagascar was lots of people did not know that it was an actual country prior to that so just having some awareness of um, what the country is where it is and what's really special about it particularly the biodiversity I think definitely if that's on people's um, radar if this is a destination for tourism then yeah absolutely definitely uh, in terms of the the habitats for lemurs, we talked a little bit about you know habitat destruction and the link between that and, and poverty. Um, there's a question here asking if different species of lemurs need more space than others, and if that um, kind of complicates things in terms of human expansion or agricultural development or whatever. Um, and then with that, there's another question asking about the, the billionaire Richard Branson, who evidently wants to introduce le lemurs into the Caribbean islands. Um, wondering what your thoughts on or that uh, are on about that, excuse me, and um, if you could explain why this is being questioned so heavily if 
the intention is to kind of introduce lemurs into the world. Sure. Rob. Um, so the first was about, oh, about space. Yes. So lemurs range from uh, being about maybe two or three ounces. So they, um, Madame Birthday's mouse lemur, lemur is tiny. It's a teeny tiny little thing. So they really only need a small area, but they need very particular spaces. They can only subsist in very specialized areas. And then there can be the Indri, which I think are, I don't remember how much an Indri weighs, maybe maybe about 12 ki kilos. I I can't remember, but they're they're a lot bigger. Maybe 25 pounds, I think, is is about what it is. Um, so the animals can vary quite a bit in, in the size that they are, which determines how much space they need. But more, I think more than that, um, many species of lemur are, are folivore specialists, meaning that they eat a variety of leaf species. And when you have specialized folivores, it can be very difficult for them to adapt to captivity. So many of the shifaka or the dancing lemurs cannot survive. Um, and lepi lemur as well. So there, there are many species of lemurs that cannot survive in captivity. Um, they can only survive in their wild habitat. So that makes those areas of particular importance because we know that if we lose those areas of forest, those lemurs are gone forever. And it's probably to do with um, the gut microbiome, the, the relationships between their foods, their natural foods and the gut microbiome that just simply can't be um, replicated outside of their natural forests. So those are, are ones that are of particular concern. And as for um, Richard Branson, he has introduced lemurs to his, his islands in the Caribbean. Um, and biologists tend to not be in favor of um, doing things like this because of the unintended impacts that can happen. So if you think of the Caribbean islands, they may not have primates, but they already have their own ecosystems. And so when we introduce new animals, we don't know what diseases those animals are gonna bring. We don't know what effect they're going to have on the habitat. Um, and those animals will always need to be cared for. So they are like, sort of like, a, like uh, they live in enclosures. So they live in like large enclosures. It's sort of like being a zoo lemur. They live on these islands in these enclosures and they're cared for by people. Um, so the, the, the reason why that tends to be controversial is the impacts on the islands. Plus it's not, um, you know, we can't do this for, for all lemurs. As I said, many species cannot survive outside of their natural habitat. And so it, it's only a select few that those lemur, those species tend to be abundant anyway. So he has ruffed lemurs and, and ring-tailed lemurs. Ring-tailed lemurs are the most, um, there's more ring-tailed lemurs in captivity in zoos around the world than any other species of primate. So those are really quite abundant and we're probably not in danger of losing ring-tailed lemurs anytime soon, but those are the ones that are on those Caribbean islands. So um, it's like, it's kind of a neat, a neat project, but it's, it's not something that will save lemurs from extinction. I see. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, switching gears here and talking a little bit more about the, the population uh, and environment issue in, in Madagascar, there's a question here asking about the UN Family Planning Program and how it's been doing in Madagascar for the last 10 years. Um, there's someone talking about their personal experience of going to Madagascar in 2009 um, and talking to one of their guides there that was really excited about the program because it helped its community um, reduce their fertility rates. Right. So how do you think is it's So I, I don't really know very much specifically about that program, but I do know that um, family planning is definitely an important part of reducing poverty and um, part of conservation. And so th this is something that is always needed, but it's, there's, the issues are, are so complicated. Um, as I said, in really rural areas where girls maybe don't go to school, it's just part of life that girls have babies early. Um, and so it's not just like having contraceptive available isn't just the solution. We need to have reduced poverty so that the girls can go to school and have an education and have alternatives and have access to family planning. Um, when we have all of these things together, um, then women choose to have fewer options 
fewer babies and space them apart, and they start much later. So if we have all of those things, it can work together and be beneficial for everyone. Um, but just having um, um, sort of sporadic access to family planning isn't um, as effective. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was so interesting hearing you talk about the education within Madagascar and how people are being trained about the flora and fauna in like the UK rather than in their homes. It just um, makes no sense. It yeah, makes sense. yeah. yeah. It's really sad, the, the yeah. legacies of colonialism. And that's still going on even today. Yeah. Wow. Um, it's it's really even hard to believe in 2023. That yeah, that it is. And that's better. part of the government being ineffective and um, mm -hmm. the system being so sort of weighed down, the bureaucracy being so weighed down that teachers don't have the ability to change curriculum um, mm -hmm. in meaningful ways. And so it has just stayed wow. the same. And in, in these communities that are more at risk and more rural, um, is there these initiatives that aim to broaden access to education for girls um, amidst poverty and amidst things like famine and uh, uh, the sort of environmental issues that keep mounting and compounding because of climate change? How, how is that working? Um, I would imagine that the, the more poverty there is, the more environmental issues there are, that would disproportionately uh, affect girls first in terms of education. And so I'm wondering how that's going. And then also just generally in terms of the buy-in at the community level for, um, for communities that might be very used to not having girls go to school, these initiatives that aim to expand access, is, is that culturally being very accepted or um, how's that going? Or maybe, maybe Dr. Sahano, that's a good question for yeah. you. As Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's a um, yeah, that's a good question because um, yeah, there is in Madagascar we have uh, different cultures. Like for I have a, a my own culture because I am from the capital, but in the south of Madagascar it's totally different. Mm -hmm. So when we want also to, that's one of the challenges. We, when we want to implement program in education and or for any uh, or mice for conservation, we have to consider first the cultural aspects. Uh, for example, in Madagascar also, um, in Madagascar in general, humans are more marginalized, but in the South, it's worse. <laughs> it's, it's really like uh, we... Human, human and the main, they cannot be at the same place, or if they are in the same place, there is a place for human and pl another place for uh, human and another place for foreigners. And I am a foreigner, and when I go on, on the south, so it's very, very difficult, and we have to work step by step uh, in terms of. Uh, um, uh, uh, knowing what is the cultural uh, aspects and how, what, how can we approach the education for girls, for example. There are some women that they consider it's normal because they, it's normal that uh, their girls would be in the kitchen when, or and, and uh, at uh, 16 years old, if uh, the mother says, "Okay, you have to 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 seek for uh, her husband because you are sixteen or years old now," it's a cultural thing. So we have to to consider all of that and just not saying uh, in in the in the village and saying no 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 it doesn't work like that. No, we have to listen first and we have to 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 take time. And to make the the approach and the program, it's it's it takes a long time, but um, we 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 see that there is some changes, and the the key fact is uh, really the education. And so we work with the schools, with the private schools, also with some public schools. But it's it's uh, the education level is that's the first first step, and listen to the people, listen to what is the cultural aspects and work through that step by step, yeah. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it important to have peer educators? Is that one of the programs that you guys use? 
I would imagine that, you know, people coming from outside the community trying to talk about um, culturally, you know, otherwise unaccepted things might be more difficult in, in comparison to having someone who's integrated into the community um, yes. talk about that. Is that, is yes, that, important? that Yeah, that's important. Yeah, that's important. Yeah. We have to find someone and build the trust relationship. Mm -hmm. This relationship is really, really important. Yeah. People Listen, tend to be really from, yeah. Uh, yeah. tend to be really suspicious um, of foreigners, particularly of, of white foreigners that are from different yeah. countries, but also of, as Sahina said, she's considered a foreigner to people in the South because she's from outside. Um, so foreigners coming in, people tend to be really suspicious. And because there's so much suspicion surrounding the government as well, it's people are just tend to be quite closed off. Um, and not interested in whatever it is that you're trying to sell kind of thing. Um, so it takes a long time. It probably took me about six years before um, local people started to think, oh, I think she might actually come back. Like she might actually do, you know, she seems like she wants to help. Um, it just really takes a very long time to, um, and I will never be part of the community. I won't, I, I will never be considered not a foreigner, but, um, I think that once you have that trust built in, it's okay to be foreign. I won't ever really understand everything, um, but but we can work together and we can figure out what um, local people want, how they want to direct our efforts um, and it is going to be the best way for us to spend our time. Yeah, amazing. And I imagine it's, it's still pretty recent, right? It sounds like colonization was uh a very recent past yeah absolutely absolutely one last question and then i'm unfortunately going to to have to sign off here i don't know if stephanie and, and marion will stay on but um i just there's a question here asking about um other efforts so we've kind of established that the government is no help but are there other organizations that you're working with that you look to for help that um, can be collaborated with to kind of expand these programs at a, at a larger scale, especially as it relates to um, just the education about the environmental um, nature of, of uh, Madagascar and the sort of local ecologies there. Sahin, do you want to talk about the Limer Conservation Network? Yes, yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, there is um, the Limer Conservation Network, is, which is a, like a, a platform that covers like uh, 60, more than 60 organic conservation organizations. And so they work on, uh, some of them are really a big organization like uh, WWF or Conservation Inter International, but also, um, some organizations work on the local scale on education, conservation, and also um, uh, project development to give like alternative uh, income generate uh, income uh, generating activities for local people. So there are many many organizations that they do really great great job, and Limu Love is also part of that. So we have, I, I would say that there are organizations that. They want to, they, they are doing their best to make change, but it's at local regional scales. Mm -hmm. And so there are amazing people, conservationists and educators, and they want to work with some local authorities. Uh, so for example, for the education, it's really true that we don't have this curriculum. We, we I never learned about lemurs when I was at school. It's, it's really sad. Uh, but in the east of Madagascar, I know that there are some organizations they want they work with um, teachers uh, to to give some curriculum, but just it can be just for some schools. And so now some uh, kids learn about the injury because they know that there are injury nearby their, their house in, in the forest. So they, it's starting to, to, to change, but at local scales. But yeah, there are many organizations that, uh, yeah, they are they're doing a really great job and 
we, in in our level we, we some we we do at the local scales and that's maybe the the most optimistic <laughs> aspect that, of um, that's been really, work. one of the things that's been really great uh in the last decade i'd say is the introduction of world lemur day um because this has really brought together a lot of people in madagascar it's just a fun day there's often like a parade in a local village and they'll feature different lemur species um, and this has really just brought a lot of awareness and is really fun um and so this has been really like i said i think maybe it was eight years ago or so that this started and now it's it's a really big deal every year there's big celebrations all over madagascar to celebrate lemurs which before 10 years ago that was unheard of right yeah yeah and I imagine that impact is going to just accelerate in the future that's huge and yeah I'm gonna have to sign off here but thank you so much for this presentation today it was so interesting to hear about your work and what's going on in Madagascar um, thank you so much for for everything that you're doing there for lemurs for people for the environment it's such a pleasure to get to hear from you both and such an honor to get to partner with you I'll uh, I'll leave it to Steph here. So thank you both so much, and thank you. have a great day, everyone. Thanks for thank the great you, question. Too. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Yes, thank you so much. As Hannah was saying, uh, I appreciate your time. Um, I'm just going to take the one last question. Let's see. There's so many. Um, just talking about the conservation efforts and how it's changed, especially over the last decade. I'm not sure if this question was asked yet, but I don't believe I heard it. Somebody was um, asking about the BBC film and how that sort of helps change conservation efforts. Do you think that might have played into that? Um, I, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I don't want to. Um, conservation is so urgent that it has to be direct things happening. So, um, there being films out that show how lovely lemurs are is wonderful because it raises people's awareness of them and and um, helps people to know what they are. But we really need like boots on the ground addressing the needs of people so that they don't have to exploit the forest. I mean, that's what needs to be happen happening really urgently. Um, so I don't think we have time to wait for how long it takes for films to do that. One of the things that's beneficial is that when we um, work with film crews, we get paid. And so that all that work goes directly to our our um, research and conservation. So in that way, they you know it is contributing to um, conservation directly. Okay. All right, one more question because there's so many good ones. Um, and to end on this note, uh, now that we're well informed on the highs and lows as you shared with us about being directly in the field, working in the field. Uh, what opportunities are there for people to travel to Madagascar and um, do some sort of field work to help protect the biodiversity there? Do you want to answer that one, Sahin? I am not sure to understand. Do you mean like volunteering or? Volunteer work uh, or mm -hmm. if they were to be a tourist, what's a mindful like way for them to travel? and support the local biodiversity. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's so well, um, I think um, many organizations, uh, they accept volunteering. And uh, in some time, we as at, at Limur Lodge, we, we also work with uh, volunteers, right? Um, and um, yeah, for, for tourism, um, I will I would um, uh, recommend to do the, you know, we have the this term of the being responsible of mm -hmm. to doing the tourism. Like for yeah. example, we, if you want to see lemurs and uh, work, with, maybe you know, target to see red lemurs rather than lemurs in in the hotel or something like that. So that's Absolutely. kind of yeah, a responsibility and avoid any interactions with uh, with lemurs but also um target some of the um, the, the place that prioritize uh, local communities uh to benefit for local communities because there are so many i would say places uh that it's really great but it do they 
uh, give some benefit for local communities or it's just the, 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 the big industry for tourism mm -hmm. and at the end of the day we don't have the benefit for local people and that's 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 really sad and that's that's not the way that we we, we want to to work with to to make a change so, it's important yeah. to do your your homework too if you're mm -hmm. going to be traveling because mm -hmm. everybody every tour op or operator every resort that you contact will tell you yes they give back to the local community. Yes, these are all wild animals. Yes, we do everything responsibly. But <laughs> we know that that's not necessarily true. Mm -hmm. um, so it's important to do your research. And if anybody is planning um, on traveling to Madagascar, you can certainly contact us um, because we have you know, lots of years of experience in knowing where good places are, what, what the good operations are. Absolutely. Thank you so much for making yourself available. Uh, and on that note, uh, we'll wrap up the presentation. Big thank you again for joining us. Um, and Dr. Sano, I know you're, it's later in the evening, so I appreciate you being flexible with us. And thank you to everyone who joined in today and participated. I will follow up soon with a uh, recording of this presentation and additional resources, including all of the amazing links and um, information that was shared in the chat box that will be shared with you. Um, us. Thanks again. Have Thank you all. Day, Thank everyone. you so much. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you very Bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.